A beam of electric light pierces the darkness over the calm waters of the Atlantic Ocean. The Titanic is quietly making its way through the waves, its passengers asleep, when suddenly a monstrous white shape is caught in the light beam. The fateful iceberg is about to rend the side of the legendary ship. April 14, 1912, only two days before someone will take a photo of a giant iceberg with a pretty unusual elliptical shape. It turns out that this iceberg most likely formed out of snow that fell 100,000 years ago. Researchers use computer modeling to figure out its origin. They used data from 1912 and added some new information about winds and ocean currents. They concluded that the iceberg was probably a part of a small cluster of glaciers in southwest Greenland. These days, it's possible to calculate the roots of such icebergs in any given year in the past. So the infamous chunk of ice was on its way from Greenland to an area further south from Cornwall. If the ship had passed through that region only two days later, the iceberg would have moved far away from the point where they met. At first, the weight of the most well-known iceberg in the world was 75 million tons. With time, it started to slowly melt away. And when it sank the Titanic, its weight was only 1.5 million tons. By the time of the collision, it had probably been melting for months. But it was still a true monster. When the Titanic sank, the iceberg was 400 feet long, and more than 100 feet of its surface was above the water. You know SOS, don't you? Three dots, three dashes, and three more dots. It's an easy enough signal to tap out in Morse code. It means save our souls or save our ship. The crew of the legendary Titanic had been desperately trying to send this signal for two hours the night of April 14, 1912. There were other ships not too far from the spot where the iceberg took down the mighty Titan of the Sea. But the call for help seemingly disappeared before it could reach them. The passenger ship SS Mount Temple did pick up the signal and try to respond, but the Titanic never got the answer. So what was silencing the ship's cries for help? Some unknown Bermuda Triangle of the North Atlantic? Consider this. Eyewitnesses say the sky was painted with a brilliant aurora borealis that cold, fateful night. Beautiful, yes. But on that day, the Northern Lights may have sealed Titanic's fate for good. You see, the aurora borealis forms thanks to geomagnetic storms. Sounds complicated, but those are basically fluctuations in the Earth's magnetic sphere. And what causes those is the Sun itself. The magnetic sphere is like a protective bubble that surrounds our planet. It blocks harmful solar rays, winds, and other cosmic dangers from reaching us. Without it, life on our planet wouldn't be possible. Earth would look more like Mars. You also have it to thank for compasses pointing north. Experts know the Earth's magnetosphere affects navigational equipment, or disrupts it. Which brings us back to the Titanic. Recently, a published weather researcher named Mila Zenkova proposed a theory that solar flares, which provoked a geomagnetic storm, could have played a major role in the Titanic's untimely demise. Solar flares make themselves known on Earth all the time. Some people are especially sensitive to the magnetic storms they cause. These unlucky folks can feel weakness, fatigue, headaches, and even mood swings. On usual days, the pressure is the same on both sides. The magnetosphere blocks all the bad stuff, and we're all happy. But sometimes, explosions occur on the sun. They can be massive, Earth-sized. These flares shoot out a wave of charged particles that collides with the magnetosphere at high speeds. Our protective bubble then goes on the defense. It shrinks, deforms, and pushes those particles toward the poles. Enter those brilliant lights dancing above the Titanic that night. In the north, we know it as Aurora Borealis. In the south, Aurora Australis, or the Southern Lights. When the magnetosphere pushes those solar and cosmic particles toward the poles, they collide with molecules of different gases. That's why you get the range of colors. For example, oxygen can be green or red depending on the distance, and nitrogen is blue or purple. 
What multiple people saw that night was exactly this phenomenon, including the second officer from the rescue ship Carpathia. He wrote it down in the logbook before getting the distress call from the Titanic. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Auroras are a visible sign of a geomagnetic storm. Now, about navigational equipment. This applies to satellite and radio frequency devices. Remember, they didn't have iPhones back in the Titanic days, so the average person couldn't notice their gadgets going haywire. But navigational devices and wireless telegraph did exist and were actively used. Rewind back to the Middle Ages, when sailors noticed that, on some days, compasses wigged out. The arrows spun in all directions, and people back then had no idea why. It wasn't until the 18th century when French scientists found out that such problematic days occur at the same time as black spots appearing on the sun. Solar flares. The mystery was solved. Now, the Titanic had the most advanced, well-known radio equipment at that time. They tested it thoroughly to make sure it worked for distances up to 2,000 miles away. Titanic's passed them all. On April 10, 1912, the massive liner left Southampton and set off for New York. The very next day, the crew started getting the first reports of drifting icebergs and ice fields. They put dots on the map to mark the coordinates and let out a sigh of relief. All the troublesome spots were north of the Titanic's planned route. But after a couple of days, the warnings were moving farther and farther south encroaching on the majestic ship. On April 14th, Captain Edward Smith decided to change course to the south in hopes of bypassing the ice. This ended up being a huge mistake. Enter the magnetic storm. If it was throwing the navigation equipment off, even by a tiny error of half a degree, the captain could have been mistakenly taking the ship right toward a cluster of icebergs. What's even worse, The radio operators ignored warnings coming from other ships. That, or they simply forgot to hand them over to the captain. As hired contractors from the radio company, they were more interested in transmitting paid telegrams from passengers on that luxurious liner. The radio transmitter kept going out of order that evening, probably because of all this private traffic. When it was finally fixed, Operator Jack Phillips received another message from the SS Californian at 10.30 p.m. Their operator was trying to warn Phillips about the coordinates of drifting icebergs, but he paid them no attention. He was nervous and in a hurry. Was the magnetic storm to blame for his frayed nerves and bad mood? We can only speculate. But as you know, some people are more sensitive to these things. The weather was fine. The ocean was calm the water was smooth as glass. Despite all the warnings, the ship continued to sail at a maximum speed of over 22 knots. An hour later, Titanic collided with the infamous iceberg. On April 15th at 12.14 a.m., in the middle of the night, Titanic's operators started to transmit the first emergency signals. The SS Californian was sailing just 20 miles from the Titanic. They could have easily come to a quick rescue. But 10 minutes before the disaster, the Californian's radio operator had gone to bed. He was the only one who understood Morse code on the ship. According to this new theory, the magnetic anomalies possibly blocked Titanic's messages to other ships. For example, the steamer SS La Providence didn't receive any signals from the sinking ship at all. Yet they were still getting transmissions from another giant, the Olympic which was 500 miles from the Titanic. That night, the signals were acting strange. They simply got lost somewhere in space. Or they were like a jumbled riddle, impossible to solve. The SS Mount Temple did get a message and rushed to Titanic's aid. But as fate would have it, the rescue ship got stuck in ice. She did arrive at Titanic's last known coordinates, but the luxury liner was nowhere to be seen. So were the coordinates accurate at all? Some people believe Titanic sank because of a mummy, not an iceberg. It all started around 1000 BCE with a mysterious woman who lived in Egypt, in the city of Thebes. People knew little about her, but they called her a priestess. Her mummy was put in a wooden sarcophagus and covered with a large lid with the image of her face and some mystical inscriptions. This place had been hidden until the first half of the 19th century. 
when a group of locals accidentally came across it. They disturbed her peace. No one knows how, but the mummy disappeared that day without a trace. A couple of decades later, a group of rich friends from England traveled to Egypt and found the empty mummy casket with the image of the priestess, whose dark eyes seemed to be looking into the void. They decided to buy it, but the buyer disappeared the same night before he even got the case. All members of the group had some accidents. The casket changed its location a couple of times until it, as some believe, ended up on the Titanic. It took more than 70 years for a robot submarine to find the ruins of this legendary ship. The wreck lies nearly 13,000 feet under the surface of the Atlantic Ocean, split into two halves. Why did the liner break apart? No one knows exactly. Some think it happened because of the water that got inside when the ship collided with the iceberg. The pressure was so powerful, it separated two parts of the vessel, starting with the ship's bottom structure. Others say it was because of the hull rivets. They had a high concentration of slag or smelting residue. And that's something that can cause the metal to split apart. The ship generally had many flaws, starting with the design. The watertight bulkheads weren't completely sealed on top. This allowed the water to flow between the compartments and, in the end, sink the vessel. The iron of the ship's rivets and steel of the hull ended up ruined because of high sulfur content, cold temperatures, and high speeds. The steel shattered and the rivets popped out quite easily. Because of this, Titanic sank 24 times faster than it would have otherwise. If the ship had hit the iceberg head-on instead of ramming it with its side, it would have probably stayed afloat. The most shocking thing is that the people who were on the Titanic that day didn't panic. They were calm, maybe a little worried, but there was no fear on their faces. To understand why they weren't afraid during one of the biggest disasters of the 20th century, you need to see what was going on through their eyes. So, you're a passenger on the infamous ocean liner. Your cabin is located on one of the top decks of the ship. You've just had a great time with your friends at dinner. Now musicians are playing a beautiful melody. Waiters are serving dessert. You go out onto the deck and enjoy the tranquility of the mighty ocean. At this moment, you feel an incredible sense of security and comfort. You're proud that you're one of the first people in the world to travel on the most high-tech ship on the planet. You go to bed in your cabin and wake up because a crew member gently knocks on your door and asks you to go to the deck. There's some kind of issue, but there's no reason to panic. No problem. You'll be happy to go out and take a look at the night sky. The moment when the ship collided with the iceberg felt like nothing more than a slight push, and some passengers didn't even hear it. They realized that something was wrong only when stewards knocked on their doors and asked them to go outside. You're on the deck. There are already a lot of people here. Everyone is more or less calm. Passengers are talking about what might have happened. Listening to the conversations around you, you figure out that the ship is supposedly sinking. <laughs> the idea seems like nonsense to you. But even if it is true, all passengers will be evacuated in lifeboats anyway. At that time, people didn't know there were half as many rescue boats as needed. Passengers were sure that everyone would be saved. Evacuation begins. Women and children go first. No one panics or tries to get into a boat before it's their turn. All men behave gentlemanly and help crew members to evacuate women. One passenger wants to get into the boat with his wife, but it's not because he's afraid to stay on the Titanic. He's just worried. It seems to him that it's less safe in the boat than on the giant liner. He doesn't want to leave his wife alone, but the crew members explain the situation to him and the man retreats without any resistance. They begin to launch flares into the air. No one pays any attention to this. Everyone thinks this is a standard procedure for a ship breakdown. If there had been many experienced travelers on board, they would have understood the flares were fired because the ship was in distress. Perhaps then, people would have started panicking, but most of the passengers simply didn't notice it. The boats are lowered one by one. People are watching the evacuation patiently waiting for their turn. There is no pushing or crowding. Nobody is screaming. The actions of the crew help the passengers to remain calm. They deliberately downplay the severity of the situation to prevent panic. 
Someone says the boats are launched simply as a precaution. Also, the crew members claim that a rescue ship is heading for the Titanic and is just a few miles away. Some passengers say they see the lights of another ship. The people who are already sitting in the boats want to stay closer to the Titanic, since this way they'll feel safer. Many passengers simply don't want to believe that something serious is happening. Even when they're told the ship is sinking, they refuse to admit it. How is it possible that the unsinkable ship can sink? But this is how the human mind works. In extreme situations, it refuses to believe that something bad is going to happen now. You don't even want to think about it. One of the passengers says that it seems to her that the danger is exaggerated. She claims that all people will return to the Titanic at any moment. Some passengers are afraid, and still, they don't want to leave the ship. Warm cabins and the safest ship in the world are here. The alternative is the ice-cold ocean and small, unstable rescue boats. Someone refuses to leave the ship because they can't find their baggage. Some passengers carry all their belongings with them. They don't want to leave them on the sinking ship. There are many immigrants on board, and some of them don't even understand English. The crew members can't explain to them what's happening. These passengers misunderstand stewards' instructions during the evacuation. They can't figure out the inscriptions on the evacuation signs. Many passengers are sure there's been some kind of breakdown in the engine compartment. The problem will be solved soon, and the Titanic will continue its journey. People only start to realize that the ship is going down when it begins tilting forward, and its rear part starts rising above the water. That's when those around you start panicking. Some jump into the water, others climb into the lifeboats without waiting in line. But in general, there's no chaos and hysteria. And this is despite the fact that there are about 1,500 people on the ship. Scientists claim that some of them never even left their cabins. Those people refused to leave their stuff behind and didn't believe that something serious had happened. During the evacuation, the orchestra is playing. This helps people to keep their cool. They hear music, and it seems to them that everything will be fine. The music keeps playing on the Titanic almost until the very end. At about 2.05 a.m., the crew lowers the last boat with passengers. Fifteen minutes later, the ship goes underwater. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.